This is World History, September 25th. This is the beginning of the Middle Ages. Now, we are going to take these slides and we are going to divide them into two, maybe three different groups. First group will look at the Dark Ages. Second group will look at the Middle Ages. And the last group will look at Medieval Times. In the 5th century, that would be the 400s, the Roman Empire is going to collapse. It's going to have several Germanic tribes invade it from 400 to 1400, approximately a thousand years. We are going to call this time the Middle Ages. Now the start of the Middle Ages is the collapse of the Roman Empire. The end of the Middle Ages is the beginning of the Renaissance. The first 400 years of this thousand year swat is called the Middle Ages. Now, generally we refer to these first 400 years as the Dark Ages. We call it the Dark Ages because there was little culture. The Roman Empire had collapsed and honestly there just wasn't a whole lot of people who were trying to put it back together. Rome had kept the schools open. With Rome gone, learning will cease. In their frenzy, those Germanic tribes who looted the Roman Empire are going to burn the libraries because they see no value. There is no economy to speak of. Everything is done by the barter system. There is no value in education. The Germanic governments are based on what are called the tribe system. Now, we encountered the tribe system when we did the ancients. This is the strongest guy is going to be the leader. And the strongest guy doesn't trust anybody because if he trusts anybody, those people might come out and take his power away. The Germanic leader is not going to agree with any other Germanic tribes because they too may be out to get him. Now in Rome, they had codified the laws, but in the Germanic tribes, it was everybody for themselves. We generally refer to this as anarchy. There was some culture, though. The culture was based on the Christian faith. The Roman Empire had established the Christian faith under the rule of Constantine, and under the rule of Constantine, certain large cities would be having a priest that would be in charge of all the other priests in the neighborhood. This priest became known as a bishop. The bishop would go from locale to locale to locale, and if somebody wanted to be a priest, the bishop would ordain them. The bishop would set standards. The bishop was generally chosen in those days from amongst the priests of that particular area. Church life offered some salvation. The church owned property. Those men who decided to join the order would go into what are called monasteries. Now, this man here is getting ready to getting ready to write the Bible. Now, he has off to the side a completed copy of the Bible, and now he must painstakingly reproduce each page. Now, since the since the Bibles are in Latin, it's important that this property owner under excuse me that this monk understand the language of Latin. He also must be fairly artistic. You can tell from looking over his left shoulder that there's a great deal of artwork. Peter, who had himself been declared, who was himself appointed Bishop of Rome by himself, is going to believe that as Bishop of Rome, he had domain over all the other bishops. Peter would take an additional title, Pope. Now, in the 400s, the Pope only ruled Rome. What we will notice as we go from slide to slide to slide is the power of the Pope is going to increase. The priest is to teach the Word of God. Now, since the priest could read the Bible, the priest could talk about the Bible in Latin terms. Now the question is, will the people in the audience understand his Latin? Probably not. So the priest is going to have to interpret the Bible in the language of the people. 
the priest will hand down the sacraments, baptize, confirmation, anointing the sick, anointing the dead. But unlike today, priests in those days took no vows of poverty, chastity, or obedience. There really wasn't any training for priests in those days. You basically woke up one day and said, I'm going to be a priest. The monasteries were located throughout the old Roman Empire. Men and women would both serve. Now, men would be in monasteries. Women would be in convents. Now, most of the men would work on copies of the Bible. Others would pray. Others would meditate. The women would also pray and meditate. But women are going to work on tapestries. Now, a tapestry is a cloth, a cloth in which a picture has been sewn into it. Generally, these tapestries are things that would be uh, handed down from generation to generation. There are still many tapestries from the Middle Ages that tell the story. We're going to skip over this next slide. We're going to look at some specific German tribes. One of the German tribes found in the old Roman province of Gaul were called Franks. Now this is why the area today is called France. It is named in honor of the Franks. Now the Franks themselves were quite quarrelsome. Uh, those west of the Rhine River were called the Clovis Franks. Now, Clovis was named after the leader. Clovis married a Christian and demanded that land ruled by him convert to the Christian faith. If the land did not, then Clovis would hunt them down and change their mind. Clovis would then go about and appoint a bishop. So in this particular case, Clovis, who is the leader of the Franks, is going to appoint his own bishop. Now, this is more the norm than unusual. Here is the land of the Clovis Empire. This is the Franks. Now, again, this area here is ruled by Clovis. Now, those of his children who rule after him will rule in the name of Clovis. The Franks, under the leadership of Charles Martel, will unite with what is now France, and that land on the western side of the Rhine River, what today we would call Germany. Now, Charles Martel was known as Charlemagne by his followers. Charlemagne is important to us because Charlemagne is going to defeat the Moors, the Muslims, who had invaded Grenada in what became known as the Battle of the Tours. Now, right here is about where the Battle of the Tours would be. And this would be the Kingdom of Clovis. And over here, this is the western side that would also be part of the kingdom under Charles Martel, or who I'm going to start calling Charlemagne. Charlemagne had laid claim to all of this land plus northern Italy. Now, in northern Italy, he would be dealing with the Lombard, Lombard tribe. Charlemagne announced that he had no intention of seeking papal lands in the central part of Italy. Because Charlemagne was not going to threaten the Pope, the Pope is going to anoint Charlemagne, the Holy Roman Emperor. Now, this would allow Charlemagne to attack those who are opposed to him in the name of Christ. Now, this is where it gets a little interesting. We know that the guy before Charlemagne, Clovis, is going to appoint bishops. Now, Charlemagne will continue the practice. Charlemagne will go to the Pope and say, I think I'm going to announce this guy as the bishop. Pope, what do you think? Now, the Pope wants to stay the Pope. He knows that Charlemagne could easily take over his lands, so he says, sure. That way, Charlemagne can announce to this people that the, that the bishop was chosen by the Pope. 
Now soon it's going to be the other way around. The Pope is going to acquire power, and he will tell the leaders, this is who I want you to appoint. Charlemagne had, appoint, had imported scholars from all over Europe. He wanted to teach his children to become good government officials. Now, this is the, the church that Charlemagne is going to build in Aachen. Now, Aachen today is in Germany. Aachen's church is an example of a Romanesque style church. In other words, it is based on how the Romans would have built it. When Charlemagne died in 814, his power, his lands evaporated. In his place, landowners who had been educated by Charlemagne's tutors built their own palaces. They chose their own bishops. Without Charlemagne's strong leadership, the Holy Roman Emperor would break up, empire would break up into feudal states. Now Charlemagne was the first Holy Roman Emperor. He will not be the last. But we need to put him in our notes for a couple of reasons. One, he is the Holy Roman Emperor. And two, he is going to try to bring culture to the western part of Germany, particularly in and around the city of Aachen. Now we're going to skip over this biography of Charlemagne. The feudal states created a system of government. Now, each, each ruler would rule over the land. He would be in charge of the land. He then would go out and try to find professional soldiers. These are what we would call the knights. Then he would go out and find the people. And the people would work the fields and do the chores. Now, the leader said, the land belongs to me, so I demand a portion of the food and craft, and in return, I will protect you from those who are going to try to hurt you. In other words, I am going to protect you from people like the Vikings. Now, all the land is owned by the titled leader. Now, the titled leader could always give it to someone else temporarily, uh, and this would, of course, be with the leader's permission. The various feudal states could not unite. Because of this, they became prey to stronger armies. And the army that is going to do the greatest danger are the Vikings. Now, the Vikings are those people who are in present-day Norway, uh, Finland, Sweden, and they are going to travel across the English Channel, they're going to travel across the North Sea, and they're going to do a great deal of damage to England, the northern part of France and Germany. The Vikings are going to say to those who they invade, if you do not pay us tribute, now tribute is money or goods or services, then we will loot and pillage your area. Until the feudal stage could unite, they were at the mercy of the Vikings, or the Magyars, who come from what is now Russia, or the Moors, who come from northern Africa. Now, I think this would be a good place to stop. I, I want to show a video that deals with the Vikings.